Thank you, Xander. How about this, huh? Can you believe it? I mean, I haven't been in a room like this in a long time. It is uh, kind and courageous of you to all show up, and uh, I hope we make a wonderful night out of it. There's a lot of people in this film. Um, because, you know, infrastructure and resources are all about people. The landscape is all about people. And one of the reasons that this was the hardest freaking thing I've ever done uh, was not only that usually I have 80 to 120 source reels, this time I had over 1,000, but also the history of California. Uh, when you f even, of course it's true in San Francisco, but when you fan out, it's a complex history. It's a violent history. It's a difficult history. It's a history of extraction, a history of taking. The images, I hope, are meaningful as well as beautiful. I hope they're serious as well as funny. There's a lot of really beautiful, funny footage in here. Um, most of the time I had fun putting this together. I'm not sure that Megan had fun putting up with me. Uh, but uh, I hope you like it and I want to remind you, every screening of Lost Landscapes is unique because you are the soundtrack. You, I'm asking you to make the soundtrack to those of you who haven't been here before to ask questions, to identify people, places, events, things, to engage in spirited dialogue with the people around you or the whole auditorium, if you like. You're free to uh, take photographs, to tweet, to use social media. Just don't shine your phone in anybody else's eyes and maybe turn off your ringer, but have fun make some noise, and um, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I had to begin with a road trip. <laughs> and each road trip in a lot of ways, I don't know, I've started to think about them as a reenactment of Manifest Destiny, maybe? Um, or not. <laughs> this was a couple, by the way. Rinkin Hill, uh, cleared for the bridge, but the bridge isn't there yet. People complained about the high rises even then. <laughs>
North Point, the last original shoreline. Twin Peaks, where's the trees on Sutro? There's the Castro for when we get back. Uh, this is a mixture of 1939 and 1955. And this is the 70s, of course. we go. Crossover Drive. Lincoln Way. Notice there's a little more of the Great Highway back then. Guerrero. There's a mask flying around. <laughs> Here we are. And these folks somewhere, somehow, back in the 30s are reenacting that moment of California. And you notice the film has decayed into little gold flecks. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> and from the able scanning hand of David Wiegleb is this beautiful shot of Market Street in 64. <laughs> See KSAN radio and TV on the right. Nineteen seventy. Many of you remember how long Market Street was torn up. It would be twice as long today, probably. <laughs> right. Pony Express, 100th anniversary. And the future. <laughs> so for years I've been hoping to find footage of the general strike and it started to happen. This is a probably a few days before Bloody Thursday when these men killed two workers at uh, Market and at Mission and Stewart. Um, but here they are performing really for the newsreel cameras because you'll see uh, in a moment there's a newsreel microphone uh, from Fox or Pathé or Paramount. <laughs> The scene here is San Francisco Harbor. 
The ship has just arrived from Baltimore through the Panama Canal, bringing in its cargo the six reels of submarine telephone cable that we see being transferred to a waiting barge. The end of the long journey from the Eastern Factory is near, but the final resting place of these cable circuits is to be the floor of San Francisco Bay. In fact, these are the actual circuits that were planned to serve the artificial island that was made to rise from these historic waters as a home for the Golden Gate International Exposition. And after serving the crowds thronging this appealing panorama of foreign and domestic attractions, these same circuits will be part of a great new cable artery. This artery will join the others already winding beneath the surface of the bay to bring the voice of America to this busy port on our western shore. There's an interesting engineering story in this sequence of pictures, but I see in them another and a special significance, and that is the extraordinary skill and technique that is mobilized in this modern day to combat a small but deadly peril to such circuits as these, a single drop of water. Yes, it is of vital importance to prevent the entry of a single drop, for if one drop can enter, so can another, and another, and another, until the electrical transmission of speech is impossible. drama and we head east this is the late 30s The supply chain was uh, interesting back then, too. <laughs> Just like a day at Prelinger Archives. <laughs> West Oakland cleared for quote-unquote urban renewal. You'll note the, recognize the East Shore. And this is Brooks Island, closed to the public, just across from um, the Ford plant in Richmond. And these kids are sort of symbolically Columbusing it. <laughs> you can go there, but only as part of a special tour. It's a wildlife preserve, a beautiful place. This is from a 1955 film about developing Contra Costa County. And I hope they weren't, they didn't have designs on the island. <laughs> Pretty natural. December 1940. Just a year before Pearl Harbor, Richmond was a contented industrial community of 23,000 people. Its long waterfront of tidelands and mud flats on the eastern shore of San Francisco Bay was punctuated by embryonic harbor development. The tempo of Richmond was that of any simple and conservative American town. Only the straggling traveler and an occasional train stopped at this community. Then it happened. Tens of thousands, some for profit, some for patriotism, some to avenge a wartime loss. From each state in the Union, and almost every hamlet in the nation, these 20th century pioneers converged on San Francisco Bay. Many came to find a new life, to clutch at an exciting adventure, but primarily every last individual wanted to help win a war. Various kinds of people, 
from every creed, every nationality, every race, all ages, people from myriad walks of life, the socialite, professor, housewife, the actor, musician, bank clerk, school teacher, the lawyer. Less than 2% had seen a shipyard or even a ship. In two years' time, the original payroll of 4,000 at yard one had skyrocketed to 93,000 in the combined Richmond yard. The newcomer became a member of the shipyard family by signing at the employment office. He was recorded as a home front worker and secured his union membership and clearance. He was fingerprinted and photographed for the permanent record and for his badge. He could authorize a payroll deduction for the purchase of war bonds. At another window, he was introduced to the benefits of the Permanente Health Plan. While the six first aid stations in the yards administered to all industrial needs, health plan members for 50 cents per week received non-industrial attention and complete health protection. Kaiser. They could go to the field hospital for full diagnosis and treatment or to the larger Permanente Foundation Hospital in Oakland. Ninety-one percent of the employees subscribed, making it the largest voluntary health plan in America. Shift changes created peak traffic loads. Every means of conveyance had to be set up. Bus lines were extended to the shipyards from all Bay Region communities. Ninety cars from New York City's abandoned elevated railway were imported to ply the 12 miles of the new electric railroad between Richmond and Oakland. Direct ferries served San Francisco residents on every ship. Still, of necessity, the majority used automobiles. Parking and road facilities were expanded. Because of gasoline and tire shortages, ride bureaus in each yard assisted in carpool operations. Those needing rides, and those providing them, cleared through these bureaus. Here also they received their supplemental gas rations. Richmond shipbuilders topped the nation in the share of the ride principle, averaged more than four riders per car. Early lack of store facilities was overcome through the establishment of large supermarkets, stopped to provide for every household need. These crowded each other along war-creative thoroughfares. Cafeterias, coffee shops, and fountains mushroomed all over the new population centers, dispensing nutrition for shipbuilding energy. In two years, Little Richmond of 23,000 had become a bustling metropolis of 130,000. So this is Port Chicago um, a few days after the big munitions explosion. Uh, after that, uh, a number of black men working, unloading explosives, refused to work. I guess they were in the Navy and were charged with mutiny and court-martial. Um, and uh, didn't get off the hook, I think, until the 80s or the 90s. I'm not sure that the charges have ever uh, really been dropped. Um, but this is, is right after this, uh, this munition ship exploded and um, looks like a bit of shell shock in town. Uh, does anybody know? I mean, I think it, it, it was, the, the force was felt up to 15 miles away. It's like a small nuke. Yeah. yeah. It's like the third largest explosion man-made that's non-nuclear. Yeah. Like in Beirut last year. Yeah, yeah, and this is in town, not that close to the um, Naval Weapons Station. Is that Antioch? Near, yeah, near there. There is a national park site there. Arinda was restricted at its, when it's, uh, it was built. <laughs> the 
placid hills of Contra Costa. Mount Diablo. Mount Diablo. This is the patriarch of a Japanese family in, who was just walking up the stairs there, farmers in the Central Valley. And um, thanks to Lloyd Molina and his family, his family members. Uh, I like to think that it's sort of a symbolic repossession of the state capital, maybe. <laughs> US 50, now 580. No wind Just wind. Water is the very lifeblood of California's richest industry, agriculture. The lack of water for irrigation and city water systems is the state's greatest problem. The federal government, recognizing the urgency of this problem and the importance to the nation of its solution, has built great dams like Shasta, Hoover, Davis, and Parker. But these are only part of a master plan for water conservation for California and the West. The Fryant Dam stores the cold waters of the San Joaquin at the base of the High Sierra. Waters which are diverted and sent south through a man-made river to parched but fertile areas in Fresno, Tulare, and Kern counties where eventually a half million new acres will be brought under cultivation. To replace the diverted waters of the San Joaquin, the world's largest pumping plant will force the waters of the Sacramento, stored 300 miles to the north by Shasta Dam, uphill 200 feet through giant aqueducts. From here, it will flow 120 miles south through another man-made river to complete the great exchange of waters between two rivers. Thus, the work of man is dramatically balancing the unequal distribution of land and water which nature has imposed on California's Central Valley, assuring its future as a land of great promise. Speaking of water, we're in Los Angeles. The moist western slopes of the high snow-capped Sierras furnish water for irrigation when needed in the Great Valley, although there generally is good rainfall.
and uh, shot somewhere in Kern County in 1947 uh, is the lettuce harvest. And what of the money earned by the Braceros? Is it all, as some people claim, drained out of this country? Hardly. Look at the Braceros when they come here. It is obvious they need a great many things, like clothes, for instance. Where do they spend their money? As a local merchant put it. As a matter of fact, they spend a great deal of their money right here. They buy clothing and other domestic items, such as transistor radios, luggage, home furnishings, items that aren't readily available back home. Take a look at the Braceros when they come into this country, and again when they leave. They have brand new shirts, pants, shoes, all items bought right here locally. Let's look at this in a little different angle. Uh, the stoop labor situation being what it is, I don't see how the local farmers can get along without Braceros. Without this source of labor, many farmers are going to be unable to make a profit. And we sure don't want this to happen because the farmer is still our best customer. Yes, with the domestic supply of farm labor being inadequate, Braceros are a must. But some people say to the farmer, well, make the pay high enough and you'll pull in all the domestic labor you need. The fact is that farm wages have gone up steadily for many years, but we still don't have enough seasonal domestic labor willing to do this kind of work. Conclusion. Unless we have Braceros to fill the gap, many stoop labor crops will be forced out of American agriculture. The consequences? Much of our food processing industry's output would be replaced by imports. These jobs, now held by Americans, would be taken by workers in other lands, and our plants and equipment would be slowed down or shut down. That was the program to import workers from Mexico. Uh, who endured conditions like this, for example? <laughs> So a few years ago, uh, Megan was invited to, uh, to look at a house that had been abandoned by its family who had passed in uh, Seacliff and found a box of film shot by a physician, an epidemiologist who was investigating the cause of valley fever. And in 3839, he took his eight millimeter camera to Kern County and made these pictures. Um, this is the territory that you see in Grapes of Wrath. And these are the people uh, in Grapes of Wrath. Uh, except these are the real ones. There's about, I don't know, 60 or 70 minutes of, of this footage, and it's, um, it's rather amazing. It was shot around Arvin, and also around, um, uh, I'll remember in a, in a second. Um, Valley fever hit uh, certain groups, especially hard workers of color were vulnerable to it, um, and it was uh, transmitted uh, spores by the wind. It's very windy there. Say again. Thank <laughs> you. 
Shafter. That's what I wanted to say. This is one of the camps that is seen in Grapes of Wrath. The other is Weed Patch, uh, further south near Arvin, California. and an unidentified strike. This is uh, more of Dr. Smith's footage. This was when the valley uh, hosted flowers uh, before pesticides uh, altered its ability to grow anything naturally. And of course the oil fields. His last shot. And you know, oil is a very charismatic, photographic subject. Uh, and these are various home movies, plus some feature film outtakes about California oil. This is in Southern California, and this I think is in Venice. Those of you who know uh, Venice will know Speedway. This is Speedway. You know, late 40s, very early, probably about 48, 49. It has a, I think it's an outtake from a noir film. I'm gonna say 48. And the canals, 1939. And the tar pits. And, uh, Latino Los Angeles from about about 10 years later, a wedding. Union Station, uh, very months after it was built in 39. And this is rare footage of Chavez Ravine, the area that was destroyed, the community that was, uh, was torn down to build Dodger Stadium. And this is um, an, an, a home for elderly people, Los Viejitos, 
in the neighborhood uh, run by actually a white uh, doctor, well known in the community. And then there's also, I just found, a, uh, and David Wigleb transferred a very unusual general shot of the neighborhood. We're hoping to find more history of. The strength of California's industries lies in the great financial houses of the West. In their boardrooms along Montgomery Street in San Francisco, and in the stock exchange on Spring Street in Los Angeles, decisions are made daily that influence the future of California and the entire Pacific world. The nation's most overtaxed communication system struggles frantically to keep up with the demands of this new, growing industrial empire and at the same time, add service for thousands of new homes every day. Public transportation systems, too, are seriously outgrown. More than four million cars are roaring over streets and highways built for only half a million. Los Angeles, the city of magnificent distances, tackled the problem with typical Hollywood disregard for cost or effort and slashed boldly through residential and business areas to construct urgently needed speedways. The state highway construction program is staggering in its scope, requiring an expenditure of $75 million a year for the next 10 years. And this is footage shot mostly by uh, Noah Larden that we have courtesy of Ruthann Butler. Beautiful footage of the LA freeways and the four level interchange. Many people photographed the four-level interchange. It was something, I think, where there was a lot of pride and perhaps almost a sense of a, a, a landmark, a center, in a city that's sometimes described as lacking a center. Uh, it'd be interesting, it's a great feature film project, the four-level interchange. And some of this is shot from the uh, observation deck at the top of Los Angeles City Hall, which is open on weekdays. This is 58 or 59, long before the Clean Air Act. <laughs> The rail yards in the foreground, LA City Hall in the background, and some gorgeous footage of Hollywood. These are made for backgrounds in feature films. City radio station. I believe this was on Mount Lee. These are home movies shot uh, while on the, the set of a Jerry Lewis movie. 
Um, some of you may have seen that this orderly orderly. <laughs> This is in Studio City. Um, you can look it up, that's actually well known. <laughs> These are cans of high C juice. to uh, Leslie Iora. We have um, films of her family um, after they left San Francisco, where they uh, ran a laundry and some other businesses, they moved to Hollywood and opened up a nursery before they were uh, incarcerated. Um, and uh, this is part of a, quite a lot of footage, actually, that was shot to exchange with their relatives in Japan. So there was a two-way exchange of 16-millimeter home movies. <laughs> this is near Western Avenue in LA. Discovery shot in Redlands, California, a promo film for the marketeer, geared to the needs of women, I think, so to speak. out their cards. We've been uh, trying to collect footage from East Los Angeles and so far just a little bit, uh, sometimes a little hard to identify. We don't know anything about this family, unfortunately. Street in East LA. Can anybody identify this? And um, courtesy of uh, Brandon Castro, uh, footage of his uncle who was in the Brown Berets, and this is the Chicano Moratorium. Kind of behind the scenes uh, footage. This was in 1970, and um, uh, it was uh, a, a remarkable uh, demonstration of, of anti-war activity and it's uh, the toll that the Vietnam War took on communities of color. And um, police fired indiscriminately into a bar and killed a, uh, a respected uh, Chicano journalist. Um, uh, and um, it's a uh, an event that uh, has had many reverberations. 
in the last 50 years. And the Brown Berets, many of you may know, were a group not unlike the Panthers. The Black Panthers, a community group um, that uh, provided service and mutual aid within uh, Latinx communities at the time. And they're pictured here. I, you know, I'm saying here that political activity is part of the infrastructure of California. And I hope you agree. And here's some um, Mr. Castro and some Brown Berets occupying Catalina, which was a symbolic occupation. They were initially welcomed. Uh, the, the, the tourist bureau decided to welcome them to kind of, you know, blunt the impact of this action. Uh, but after a while, they became a little bit of uh, trouble. Yeah. See, here's the county sheriffs keeping an eye on them. Um, and that's the, I think it's the Pasta Ya flag, and the flag of Mexico, of course. And, um, and, uh, and then they did their best to, to get rid of them after the initial sort of honeymoon. <laughs> and these are from 8 millimeter films that, uh, that Brandon Castro has uh, kindly let us scan and a lot of family material as well. I think these papers have something to do with this car. <laughs> and uh, a special event in Castro's life. And I love the Tom Hayden sticker. This is a, uh, a Japanese-American family, we don't know their name, and this is somebody who took on into a plane and flew over to Los Angeles in 1946, Terminal Island, uh, San Pedro, uh, Long Beach area. Look at all these military ships, probably shouldn't have photographed them from the air. <laughs> Anybody recognize that? So Spruce Goose, Howard Hughes wooden plane in Long Beach, where it sat for many years till it moved up to Oregon. Oh, uh -huh. Liberty Ship, quite possibly built in Richmond. Another pass. <laughs> Made of wood. The Jones family lived in Long Beach and shot some beautiful home movies. Um, and here they're at LAX, uh, flying somewhere, we don't know where, in around 1954.
And this is just a stock shot. Don't know where it is. It's a beautiful shot. I think it fosters certain illusions, but it's also an amazing <laughs> image of Sprawl. <laughs> She's an actor. <laughs> Anybody know where this is? I think it's towards the desert. This is real estate development in Desert Hot Springs in the 50s. Attracting, trying to attract people from the LA Basin to buy unimproved stretches of desert. <laughs> some of these towns succeeded, some of them didn't. This is of course completely built up now. Go to Wikipedia to read the history of Zizix. The old plank road. somewhere in Los Angeles, preparing for new houses. And you'll recognize this, those of you who commute to Santa Cruz, this is Pacifica. This is my commute, so, okay, so originally this was like eight minutes long and I had to cut it down to 40 seconds. <laughs> Half Moon Bay before it was all built up. Intersection of one and 92. We're on the way to Santa Cruz. Russell Sprouts probably, or artichokes. Keep that story moving. <laughs> and this is mostly still here, the Santa Cruz Boardwalk, the casino, privately owned. bridge. <laughs> Bring your cats to the beach. When the Santa Cruz campus opened in 1965, 
It already had a past. A hundred years before, it had been a pioneer's ranch. Now there are 600 students. Most of them are freshmen, and most of them live in trailers. Most of them also are members of the campus's first Oxford-style college, Cowell College, named for the founder of the ranch. Cowell and the second college, Stevenson, are almost complete. And in the future, Santa Cruz will have more colleges and many more students. But already, the corporate atmosphere which college living encourages is becoming a reality. I've never made so many, you know, even though there's not much romantic interest, I've never made such close friends. I think, you know, that the intimate kind of living situation forces you into this kind of thing. And then the bad things are like, you absolutely can't get away. You know, I, I just so long for a room of my own. I mean, there's definitely no privacy. I don't know. Somehow time manages to get taken up, and I'm not quite sure how. I've always tried to figure this out, and I never could. Oh, there, there are always people to just mess around with. I remember at first, you and Kathy were saying something about, well, there's never any dates around You never go on a date around here. No, you, you know? don't. And then you true, laugh. But it doesn't matter. I don't know, maybe definitions of dates. You just don't call anything a date, really. Yeah. 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 I must yeah. say I like it. somebody who knows this history. One form of the nature culture interface. <laughs> In the grove that's been uh, threatened by recent fires, and I don't think the we know yet. We haven't been told what happened. The life of the lumberjack attracts hardy men, men who are not afraid of work. For there is still work and danger for the men who fell the big trees of redwood, pine, and tamarack. Mechanical improvements, however, have taken away some of the backbreaking part. Today, modern trucks and tractors get the giant logs from forest to mill. Several billion board feet of lumber come from the mills of the far western states each year. And various uh, communities in Northern California. Some old growth. Home movies from a logging family. She has just fed the crew steak for their hard work. And we don't know what town this is yet, but this is um, kind of amazing footage of the mill. And the workers doing the work. Are these all movies? 
This is a home movie. I imagine that it's, you know, shot by the, somebody that owns or runs that place. And again, we don't know this man's uh, tribal affiliation. We don't know where this is yet, but I hope we find out. Home movies of these landmarks of uh, civil engineering and human uh, changes on the land. Water and water power. PG&E's plants. I've spared you the other 19 that are in this film. <laughs> and I don't know where this is either, but um, it looks like it's electrified, isn't it? No. Yes. Jay, any ideas? I drove across uh, Shasta Dam last week, uh, and um, of course the road's a little wider now, uh, and kind of looks the same except that there's no water anymore. It's about 20 to 25 percent capacity. Water power, the backbone of industry, is inexhaustible in California. It needs only to be harnessed. Work is in progress on private and federal projects all over the state in an attempt to meet the demands for power for this and future generations. The penstocks of the government's Shasta Dam send the waters of the Sacramento River through giant dynamos capable of producing enough power for not one, but several major cities. San Francisco engineers added a new lake to the map in the heart of Yosemite when they built Hetch Hetchy Dam to supply their city with water and power. And thirsty Los Angeles reached up 175 miles in the High Sierra to take the entire Owens River water supply. Outtakes from sort of a how-to film shot uh, close to Ontario, California, and in the desert.
Good idea for a date. Atomic Energy makes an important debut on the West Coast as a giant boiling water reactor near Pleasanton nears completion. The huge capsule, which will contain still another steel building, will house the radioactive metals which will turn water into steam, which will furnish 5,000 kilowatts of electricity to the surrounding area. The $10 million project is undertaken by private capital in cooperation with the Atomic Energy Commission, and it is one of many which will dot the nation in the near future. for their dinner. And here it comes at last. Like healthy pigs everywhere, they're always hungry. These pigs are fed the scraps of food that people don't eat. They live in clean pens with shade and running water, and every week a government agent inspects them to make sure that they're healthy and well fed. Each pen opens into a concrete feeding alley. Thousands of pigs like these grow fat on food that would otherwise be wasted. Food we separate and save for them at home. But a tin can or a piece of glass isn't good to eat. That's why we separate our refuse. This broken piggy bank shouldn't be here, but here. Our crew collects bottles and tin cans in a different kind of truck. When the truck is full, they cover it with canvas. Some bottles like these are set aside. They'll be returned to manufacturers who will sterilize them and use them again. This job takes sharp eyes and close attention. The rest of the glass is sorted into two large bins. One for colored glass, the other for clear glass. This mountain of glass is glass that you have thrown away. After the glass is broken and washed, these men sort through it to remove corks and bottle caps. Clean broken glass is called cullet. It's melted down and used to make new bottles. There's some cullet in all ordinary glass. So it goes, bottles, broken glass, cullet, and new bottles again. Land. <laughs> Back.
back on the uh, East Shore Freeway. And this is this film uh, promoting a, a wise development in Contra Costa County. That was Highway 24, downtown Lafayette. <laughs> Somebody has just left the city and moved into the suburbs. <laughs> and there was sprawl. <laughs> this is somewhere around San Jose. A lookout spotting a fire quickly determines its direction and contacts the ranger's office. Here, a dispatcher with similar information from other lookouts or reports from air patrols or citizens determines the fire's exact position. By radio or telephone, men and equipment from the nearest fire suppression crew station are dispatched to the fire. By striking fast and striking hard, 95% of the fires fought each year are controlled before they have reached 15 acres in size. But sometimes, often during periods of extremely hot weather and high winds, a fire will spread too rapidly for control by the initial attack forces. With action developing on many fronts, the fire boss must direct his forces over a large area under different conditions of terrain and forest cover. When necessary, he uses aircraft to scout the fire. A trained observer provides him with a steady flow of information concerning the spread of the fire. The best use of manpower and equipment is accomplished through constant air to ground communication and by coordinating work of widely separated forces by radio. The protection and management of the wildlands is of personal concern to every citizen of California. Each has a stake in them. Those people who own the land and depend upon it for their livelihood are directly concerned. The majority of the people of California are not owners of the wildlands, but are dependent on the products from these lands. These people, as well as the landowners, benefit from good forest practices on the timberlands. Proper development of woodland grass and brush areas for livestock and wildlife. And effective prevention and control of fire, insects, and disease on all the lands. Most of all, protection and development of the wild lands means more water for new homes and cities and for new industries. More water to raise more food for the citizens of the state and nation. Full development of the wildlands means more lumber, more plywood, more pulp, and other forest products. It means more beef and lamb for the nation's tables, more wool for clothing, more of all animal products, and more opportunity for rest, relaxation, and wholesome outdoor pleasure during summer vacations and on weekend outings. It means continued enjoyment of California's wildlife and recreational opportunities that have few equals anywhere in the nation. Thank you.
Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for your support.